Hi everyone, um, this is chapter 12, which is on thermal properties of materials. Um, this is going to be our third uh, chapter in uh, the kind of the heat and temperature kind of uh, realm of physics. Um, so we want to begin by talking about matter in terms of a kinetic model. What do we mean by this? Well, essentially, we want to be able to describe matter in terms of how the molecules moves. So let's try to do this by first, I would like to do an example uh, to, to kind of explain to you the scale that I'm talking about here. So let's assume that we have a substance, let's say iron, right? And its molecules are arranged in kind of a lattice formation, right? So essentially, you know, the, these dots here represent uh, represent uh, individual molecules or atoms. Um, and I'm gonna use the, the, the terminology atoms and molecules interchangeably in the course of uh, this discussion. So don't get too hung up upon uh, whether I mean atoms or whether I mean molecules. I quite simply just mean, you know, some kind of uh, a particle, like an element, um, like some kind of a particle that could describe uh, the building blocks of this material. So let's say you have um, the atoms of something like iron arranged in a simple lattice, like a cubic lattice that you have here, right? So you know that the density of iron, you could look this up, is uh, 7,900 kilograms per cubic meter. And uh, you know that uh, the, the molar mass, the molar mass of uh, atomic, uh, of uh, iron is 56 grams or 56 times 10 to the negative three kilograms, right? So from this, we can calculate the um, the, the the amount of moles that are in one cubic meter. Um, so essentially, it's just going to be 7,900 divided by 56 times 10 to the minus 3, um, which is 1.4 uh, times 10 to the 5 moles. So this is how many, um, how many moles you have in one cubic meter of iron, a solid block of iron. Um, also, you know the Avogadro's number, right? Remember the Avogadro's number is 6.02, 6.0 times 10 to the 23 atoms, depending on you know which which book you look at. Um, but if you multiply these two guys together, um, you basically arrive at 8.2, 8.5 times 10 to the 28 atoms in a, a cubic meter of uh, of uh, um, iron. So if Let's assume that these atoms are arranged just like this in a, in a, a cubic lattice. So along one side of uh, this uh, one meter cubed uh, cube, there will be um, cube root of 8.5 times 10 to the 28 atoms. So that works out to be 4.4 times 10 to the nine atoms. And the, 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 this, the, length, uh, the side uh, length of this cube is one meters, right? So the interatomic spacing, now let me write that out here. The interatomic spacing is going to be 1 divided by 4.4 times 10 to the 9, which is 2.3 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. Now, I wouldn't get too hung up about this stuff here because, um, you know, we've made an assumption that uh, the atoms are arranged in a, a cubic arrangement which is in fact not true. Um, so we should not give this estimate anything more than one significant figure. Um, what you ultimately want to take away from this is this is the distance. This is the, uh, this is the scale that we're talking about, 10 to the minus 10 meters. That's what we're talking about, right? Um, so you, you can take this 10 to the minus 10 as an order of magnitude of the spacing of atoms in a solid. So you can do a similar calculation for liquids and gases. So this brings us to what is called the kinetic theory, a kinetic model of uh, matter. So it's used to explain why matter can exist in different phases, so solid, liquid, and gas, and how matter can change from one phase to the next. Basically, this you know this uh, this theory, and you can see it here that the spacing uh, between atoms and molecules increases as you go from uh, the solid phase from to a liquid phase, and then eventually to a gaseous phase. But what uh, this theory is stating is that first of all. Uh, matter is made up of particles that are constantly moving. All the particles have some kind of energy, but the energy depends on the temperature um, that this sample of matter is in. And this in turn is going to determine whether this substance is in the solid phase or liquid phase or gaseous phase. Um, so, uh, molecules in the solid phase will have the least amount of energy 
and uh, the gas phase particles ha will have the greatest amount of energy. Now, the temperature of a substance is the measure of the average kinetic energy of the particle. This is exactly what we've been talking about in our previous uh, two chapters. The extra piece that we have now added to this discussion is that there are spaces between particles of matter and the average amount of empty space between the molecules gets progressively larger as sample of matter moves from the solid phase to the liquid phase and then to the gas phase. Lastly, there are attractive forces between the atoms or molecules, what have you. And these will become stronger as these particles move closer together. And these attractive forces are called intermolecular forces. So clearly a solid would have stronger attractive forces than a liquid and uh, uh, least of all a gas. And if you recall, go back to our video on ideal gases, you will see that one of the assumptions uh, that we have to say that something is an ideal gas is that there is no attractive force between the um, molecules uh, of that uh, ideal gas. So let us talk in a little bit more detail about the individual three states of matter. And from there, we can have a discussion about what it takes um, to move between uh, from one uh, state of matter to another. Now let's consider a graph like this. And I promise we're talking, gonna be talking about solids and uh, liquids and gases and what the differences are between the two, but let's consider an example like this, a chart like this where you know, you're gonna try and add some energy to a given material, right? And um, we're gonna see what happens to its temperature. So you're gonna, and in this case, let's keep it simple. Let's say we're heating up this material, right? Um, so what you're gonna find is this uh, temperature of this material um, is going to increase for a certain amount of time, right? And then you're gonna see something like this. You're gonna keep on adding more energy, but no more um, temperature increases happening. And then all of a sudden, a temperature increase starts happening again. And then again, you're gonna see something where you see a flat line where this energy is getting added, not, but it's not changing the temperature at all. And after some more time, you know, you've added a little bit more energy, um, you might see another relationship like this where the temperature is again increasing as you add more and more energy. So what do we think is happening here? Let's take a look at this. So I'm gonna name some sections here just to, for the sake of simplicity here. So this, let's call this point A and point B, C, D, E, and F. So let's keep it simple like this, right? So let's talk about what's happening in each of these sections. Well, I think A to B is pretty clear you've just, you know, you're, you're adding, you're adding uh, energy to uh, this substance. And um, what's happening here is that your uh, kinetic energy of the particles is increasing, right? Like you, that, that is clearly because we know that an increase in temperature uh, leads to more and more uh, motion uh, of the particle. Um, the vibrational energy essentially increases, uh, and that is what's causing the kinetic energy to, to change with temperature. So the kinetic energy is gonna go up between uh, one uh, between points A and B. But what is happening between B and C at this point? Is the kinetic energy changing? No, it's not, nothing is happening there. So it's pretty clear that like something else is, is, is happening here, um, and uh, it is, actually on the side of potential energy. So the potential energy is increasing. Why is the potential energy increasing at this point? Um, so what do you think is uh, the reason for that? And actually, let me just write this down here uh, so that it's clear to you that here, this is um, heating up between A and B. That's what's happening, simple heating up. Between B and C, what we find actually is that you know, the forces that are being present between uh, the atoms or the molecules, you that the energy that's being added between B and C is being used to overcome the forces. This means that the potential energy of the molecules in it is increased. And th this process actually is just a melting process. This right here, this is a melting process. And the energy uh, that is uh, being applied here is called the latent heat of fusion. And uh, we'll talk about this in, uh, in, in more detail in subsequent videos, but for now, just take it as a given. So the solid, uh, you've added some energy uh, to overcome the forces between uh, the, the mo molecules of the solid. And uh, as a result, you've melted this thing and it's changed to a liquid state. So now 
heating is continuing, atoms can move more freely in the relative, uh, relatively speaking, in the liquid phase, but they're still close enough to experience some level of interatomic forces. And they still have some potential energy uh, associated with these forces, as well as kinetic energy corresponding to the temperature. So the rigid forces between the molecules have been broken, but the kind of the, the, the mean separation between the molecules has not really increased significantly. Uh, this is why you're going to find that liquids have a density similar to solids, right? So if you think of uh, and um, uh, like a like ice, it has a density of 0.9 kilograms per cubic meter, um, and uh, water itself will have one kilogram per cubic meter uh, kind of um, d d density. So it's uh, I beg your pardon. I meant to say grams per centimeter cube. Please uh, please forgive me for that. Um, so that eventually, you know, that that temperature of the liquid is eventually increased to its boiling point, which is what D is. That's your boiling point. So once again, between C and D, the kinetic energy is going up and the potential energy is not really changing, but potential energy comes into play uh, at, uh, at the point D through point E, where the kinetic energy is not gonna change, but the potential energy will once again uh, change. And this guy then is called, this energy that, uh, that you're putting in from this point on, right? This guy, is called the, the latent heat of vaporization. So you are trying to overcome whatever entratomic forces are in the liquid so, so that the atoms can escape into the gas phase. And um, th this essentially, you know, you're now moving the molecules far enough apart for the interatomic forces and hence the associated potential energy to be negligible. Remember that one of the assumptions of the kinetic theory is that for ideal gas, and I said this before, there are no forces between atoms and molecules because these forces are negligible. Um, I didn't uh, draw this fully to scale, but what you should kind of take away from this is that the latent heat of vaporization is uh, much greater than the latent heat of fusion. So let me write that down, so the latent heat of vaporization, vaporization is much greater than the latent heat of fusion. The, the energy required basically to completely separate the molecules is greater than that required to break the rigid bonds in the solid. Um, and the, another way you can think about this is that, you know, there is atmosphere above the liquid, so the atmosphere itself needs to be pushed back for the liquid to turn into vapor. Um, so, and, and, and that, that's one of the reasons why the volume of vapor is much greater uh, than the volume of a liquid for the N equivalent mass. So I wanna talk about one last thing, uh, which is, um, as it turns out, what we find is uh, when you have evaporation, there is a bit of a cooling effect. Why does that happen? So what you have to understand is that boiling will occur only at a particular temperature for a given pressure. However, evaporation can occur at any temperature. Essentially, you know, molecules can be lost from the surface of a liquid at any temperature by evaporation. Why is this? Remember, not all molecules are moving at the same speed, as you, you, know, you know from our work in, um, uh, in, in, in previous uh, videos. The, the, you know, something which has a high enough speed, a molecule with a high enough speed, may actually escape the attract attractive forces of the molecules in the surface region of the liquid and leave the liquid entirely. So this can happen at any temperature, but the greater the liquid temperature, the greater the number of fast moving particles and the greater the rate of loss of molecules from the surface. This fits in with the everyday evaporation that the evaporation rate increases with an increase in the number, in, in the temperature of uh, the surroundings. Next, the loss of these fastest molecules means that the average speed of those molecules that are remaining will fall, and with a corresponding fall in average kinetic energy, and thus a fall in temperature. This means that evaporation will tend to cool the remaining liquid. This also means this is why you need to add in more and more and more and more energy to heat up the remaining liquid to go uh, into the vapor phase. This, this is another reason why the latent heat of vaporization is higher than the latent heat of fusion. 
So that brings us to the end of this video. In our next video, we're gonna look at concepts like specific heat capacity. And essentially, you know, the, the what is the effect of heating on temperature? You know, like how do you actually measure that? We can look at that and then that is going to arm us with the right information to be able to go into then talking about latent heat uh, of vaporization and fusion. So I will see you in the next video.